Welcome everybody to another episode of Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, and we are in the Lost Woods. Now, I'm not really sure what I was expecting when I first played this game and encountered the Lost Woods for the first time, but it certainly wasn't this, I'll tell you that. And sure enough, we are stopped by none other than Kapora Gabora, being his usual trolley self. But regardless, I don't know what I was expecting. I was expecting maybe more of like a maze-like type of forest. But I guess just because of the whole engine and the limitations of the Nintendo 64, they couldn't really do too much with a maze-like force than this, where it was just singular individual sections connected by logs and everything loading up the next section. So overall, not as ideal as I would really want a Lost Woods to be, but given the technical hardware limitations probably of the era, this is the best we were going to get for a Lost Woods. At least for our 3D, first 3D incarnation. Now, as you notice, you want to go after where the, where the music is the loudest. Because when I, if you noticed when I was over at the other log, there was no sound, hardly any music. In fact, I think... Oh! This is where Navi actually lets you know to go back and see Saria, if Saraya. If though, albeit a little bit of a... Uh, what's the term? subtle way. She, she subtly tells you to go back and see her. But yes, you want to follow the music where it's loudest. The tunnel where it's loudest, that's the correct path. Otherwise, you'll probably enter the wrong path, be warped straight back to the beginning of the whole Lost Woods, and waste more time. Now, these guys look menacing, and by all rights and accounts, they should be very powerful enemies to defeat. But they're extremely simple. They're beyond simple. They just like kind of circle around you and then they come in close with an attack that can easily be blocked with a, sh a shield. And that's pretty much it. You just get in there after they strike. And you'll have easily beaten them. One of the easiest enemies in the game, despite looking very formidable. Very dangerous. Now this part is a little trickier than you would probably think, just because of camera angles. It kind of shifts open to more of a up top down view, but as a result, you can't really see too much what's ahead of you. And as such, uh, and as such, I had a really hard time trying to figure out how to angle the camera right. And so I took a lot of unnecessary hits as a result. So you're going to be he hearing the lovely uh, single heart beep of death. Let's just have that bore into your brain for a little bit. I mean, you'd think after so many Mega uh, Legend of Zelda, I was about to say Mega Man, <laughs> Legend of Zelda games, they'd give you an option to stop or turn off after a certain amount of time the the uh, three heart beep of doom and honestly I don't think there was an easy way to get around this without getting hurt but amazingly I took the chance to jump over him in the water this is honestly the hardest part of this whole area is just getting through these Deku scrubs trying to man navigate through that crazy angle of camera. If they just allowed the camera to be back behind you that whole for that whole segment, it would have been a lot easier. Now, why Soraya would want to go this deep in the Lost Woods to go play her song and be by herself? Who knows? As I mentioned in the previous video, I didn't really know to come over here. I mean, yeah, I, what was it? Navi told me to come back and say, what would Soraya think that you were going to save all of Hyrule? So after coming to a dead end at Goron City, I came back to the Kokiri village and I looked at her, I looked in her house, I broke all her pots, 
I looked in other Kokiri houses. I even went back through the Deku tree and to see if she was in there my first time. And then it was not until I think I'd start talking to a couple of the Kokiri kids that one of them said, Oh yeah, she's in the in the Lost Woods. And I'm like, what? Where's the Lost Woods? Because at that time, I hadn't explored the upper ridge behind one of the houses where you throw the rocks, the little rock circle, to know that there was a Lost Woods entrance up there. So I was completely lost. I had no idea where to go. Like, yeah, Sir Eyes in the Lost Woods. Where's that? <laughs> oh my goodness, so many mistakes I made. I can't... I can't begin to remember how long the game actually took me to beat my first time. Probably months. Of course, the first order of business is to get hearts. Thankfully, the game developers were smart and they gave you an easy way back out of this section. Otherwise, any remaining Deku scrubs probably would have killed me at this point. So pretty much you can go atop the, the, over the top of these hedges to make it all the way back to the beginning of this area and skip it entirely on your way back. But before that, we actually have a fairy fountain here. Very much needed. There's a pretty grim dark fan theory that every fairy that heals you, either from a bottle, bottle or one that you catch out in the wild, which I just did, like, gives up their life and dies a horrible <laughs> death to just heal you. There's actually a comic about that. It's kind of funny and morbid at the same time. Wow, he saw this twice in one section. most part, the Song of Soraya allows you to talk to her wherever you are in the game. Once in a while, she'll give you a couple of hints or tips on what to do or where to go. But, you know, Soraya's a Kokiri from the forest. I mean, her breadth of knowledge is not that large. And no, I don't want you to say it again, you troll. <laughs> so, in the end, talking to Soraya is not really that beneficial for most of the game. You really only need the song for one or two instances to move the plot forward, and outside of that, the song is more or less collecting dust for the remainder of the game. Now it's clear that I'm probably not gonna make it to Kakariko Town, probably before sunlight. So I'll just take the path so there's less monsters to deal with and avoid and dodge. I do like the fact that Death Mountain, although it's like a static graphic in the background, is tall enough and large enough that you can see it from almost anywhere in Hyrule Field. So no matter where you go, you can kind of look toward the northeast and see the silhouette of Death Mountain. Kind of goes to show you how large it's supposed to be, where you can see it from almost any angle. Not the most ideal time to come into Kakariko Village. It's actually kind of a better entry into the village if you come in during the day, because then you can kind of see from the higher camera angles village life and you know the movement of certain NPCs as they go about their business constructing, uh, I think, a building in the middle of the whole town. Why would you think I'd want to go to a graveyard? And he's still prompting me to go to the graveyard. 
Wow, that is the start of a side quest if I ever saw one. Now, this is completely optional. You really don't need to do it at all, but I think I should show it because it was a memorable sequence for me. Dark no scary. Well of three features. But the whole graveyard sequence to get the sun song for your ocarina, it's completely not necessary for my minimalist run at all. But I want to showcase it so I can talk a couple stories about it. It was definitely one of the most iconic sequences that really stuck with me for most of my childhood when playing this game. Now obviously, I was well versed enough to the point where I knew that pushing or pulling or doing something with each, each of the gravestones would give me something. And some of them do. Some actually have rubies or hearts underneath the gravestones and others have poes or ghosts that you need to fight, just like classic Legend of Zelda. And then some actually have holes to little small grottos. So I tried every single one of them, fought the pose where I needed to. In fact, I think this is one of them with the... Nope, completely wrong. I completely forgot that this one was a bad one. <laughs> the Poe is similar in nature to the Wolfos. That it just circles around you over and over and over again. And only when it's visible can you actually strike it and hurt it. And of course you can block its lantern attack with your shield. Now obviously, you had to check these two gravestones to the left and right before, you know, doing anything. I mean, you could probably skip them all together, these two both Po fights. But at the time, I didn't know what to do with that Triforce Mark. I didn't really make the connection with the Zelda's Lullaby and the Triforce Mark that this is what I need to do to, yeah, the Crystal Royal family of Hyrule is inscribed here. So I didn't make the connection that the song opens up the way to a large underground tunnel. And so the designers, at least for your first time through the game, prompted these Poe's to appear not by touching the gravestones like all the others in the graveyard, but just by looking at it. And that's so you are forced to fight these creatures and hear what they have to say. I'm sure you did. You know, I have a theory or a hunch that both Flat and the other the other composer brother, they're one and the same ghost even though they look different. And I have a little bit of evidence to back up my theory there. Oh, he also is a troll, just like Kaymore, Kaymore, I forgot. He puts uh, the cursor directly on yes. Sharp, yep, flat and sharp. Which makes sense since they are composer brothers and those are two terms used in music. But like before, pretty simple. Just kind of keep your eyes locked on him, wait till he materializes, and two jump strikes and he's dead. I'm dead again! What? You again? That! That piece of dialogue is what leads me to believe it was the same ghost both times. I also think this ghost likes to lie a lot. But the one thing he doesn't lie about is the secret research they were doing with the, the Sun Song and where they hid it. Well, that's convenient. In fact, there 
is a song or a way to cause the, the sun or the moon to rise in just about every single 3D Legend of Zelda, with the exception, I believe, of Twilight Princess. Twilight Princess does not have an option of quickly summoning the sun or the moon. Which is inconvenient in a couple instances. You know, I'm an impatient guy sometimes. And I really want the sun up now so I can talk to this person in a shop, right? <laughs> this will be the first time of many that we're going to be playing Zelda's Lullaby on top of a Triforce Mark. This is your first instance of doing such a an action, and so from here on forth, you will know what to do on any Triforce Mark. This whole sequence is about teaching the player what to do with the song that Impa gave you. And in, re in, the, in the end, you will get a much nicer song, which has a lot more practical usage. Okay, so once I figured out how to get in there, we get to a rather creepy, creepy area. First and foremost, before we can move any further, there are two torches up there on the upper parts of those stairs, which you can do either Den's Fire, or you can do Fire Arrows when you're older. And I think all that you get out of it is like a chest of bombs or something. Nothing really substantial. That's one thing I didn't like about the upgrade to the GameCube port, is that the control stick for the GameCube controller is very, very finicky. And you could overshoot your targets almost all the time with that con So if you see me struggling trying to aim well, it's because I'm using the GameCube controller. Now, oh my goodness, these redeads. These freaked me the flip out my first time playing this. Yes, that freaky scare uh, scream. Whenever you get near them, uh, they'll turn to you and freeze you in place with their scream. And the closer you are, the more they can just continually loop you in the freezing scream frame and then they'll just hop all over you and suck the life out of you. It was, oh my goodness, I didn't really want to come down here after I figured out they were down here. I was just like, nope. Nope, we're going back topside. <laughs> so, out of all the enemies that they designed for Legend of Zelda, Redeads have got to be one of the creepiest ones. They almost remind me of the Regenerators from Resident Evil 4 on the island. The ones that keep regenerating? <laughs> Man, those things are just creepy with those little... A little breathing sound. Oof. Makes your hair stand on end. So, sound is very important for a lot of reasons. The scream is one thing for the Redeads, and the second thing is the moaning. Once you hear the moaning, you know they're somewhere nearby. And they're not wrong. The sun's song gives you an easy way out to kill the Redeads. You play it, and let's see here, I think they will freeze in place for a short amount of time. Now obviously since this is a minimalist run, and I never really needed to use the Sun Song, I'm not going to kill these Redeads, but as you can see, they're easy pickings now. But just to give you a little demonstration of the power of the Sun Song. But yeah, that was one of my favorite sequences that really stuck with me when I was a little kid. And it just goes to show that there's a lot of little secrets all over the world in Ocarina of Time, even in places such as the Graveyard. So with that, we are going to call it here at the end of this video, and we'll move on towards Death Mountain and the Goron City, and see why we had to get Soraya's song first. Until the next episode, everybody, see you later.